So, the big question is this. How are entrepreneurs and real estate investors like us, ones who want to grow our businesses and who are tired of paying for really expensive alternative lending? How do we tap into the most inexpensive money available and do it without the hassle of typical borrowing? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Merrill Chandler, and welcome to the RUFable Podcast. Welcome to the RUFable Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the secret power your identity has over your funding approvals, right? So stay tuned, and we'll see you in a second. Welcome back. Okay, now this is like one of my favorite subjects and it blows everybody's mind every single time that we discuss this in any form, whether it's an abbreviated conference presentation that I do or just chatting among clients or our tech training. This is crazy important and powerful to your fundability. And I'm actually gonna show you in this uh, episode how we're going to save your identity from even identity theft, from fraud. I mean, making your identity bulletproof. So you ready to go? Let's check out how we're going to, how we're going to make your identity so much a part of your fundability. All right. Now, what is a personal credit identity? right? We need to get the definitions down so that we can understand how we're, because this is a deep dive, guys. The, it doesn't, you've never heard this stuff before and you will never hear it anywhere else because you probably aren't walking the hallowed halls of FICO and talking to the, the score engineers and the business uh, scoring development teams, right? I've had that opportunity and we've been able to create a magnificent review for you um, at, through each one of these. So let's, let's get into it. The personal credit identity is comprised of two types of uh, data points, right? There's identifiers and identifiers are name, social security uh, number and your date of birth. Those are your identifiers. Then there are what are called locators. Locators are your address and your phone number. Now, we call them a PCID, a personal credit identity. So, but you're going to hear me refer to it that way. But a personal credit identity is a single version. Hear me, guys. A single version of your credit identity that is reported by your creditors on positive accounts. I will repeat that. A, a PCID, a a personal credit identity is a single version of your identity, meaning one name, one address, one date of birth, one social security, et cetera. One version of your identity that it reports to only personal accounts. All right. So that, now why is the identity important? Because of the three major underwriting, uh, 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 the, of, of the three major underwriting criteria that Underwriting asks three massive questions. Who exactly am I lending my money to? Where exactly can I find them? And how exactly am I gonna get paid back? Every other borrower behavior, every other data point, everything is aligned to answer those three questions. Now I keep talking about data, but here's the thing guys, you are not a person. You're a government identification, your driver's license is the only link between your human being and the data points uh, that the bureaus and FICO and lender software measure. All of these, every one of these data points are, a, a, are vital in making you fundable so that you can pass automatic underwriting guidelines. Now, what I want to look at here is, is so just remember, we're talking about data, not Yes, my name's Merrill Chandler. They should be, they, they know me. I go to the bank all the time, right? But as we've discussed, and we will be discussing further, the move from automatic underwriting into manual underwriting, uh, I, I mean, the, the movement from automatic underwriting, the movement from manual underwriting to automatic underwriting is a movement from your person to 
your data. And this is why we say that you are not a person, you're a data point. So when we look at your data points, each one of the, each one of your lenders, each one of your creditors, your lenders are going to be reporting your credit accounts that you have with those lenders, but they're going to be, they're going to be using your identification information, one or more versions of your name, one or more versions of your address, etc. The more versions you have, the more confusing it is to future lenders. Your creditor may know, like in my case, your creditor, uh, my creditors may know me by Merrill Chandler, Merrill R. Chandler, Merrill Ray Chandler, but future lenders do not. So the fewer versions you have of your name, it increases lender confidence. So our, the objective of this entire episode is how badly is your identity, your personal credit identity, your PCID being reported? How badly is that, how far out on the rings instead of the bullseye on the target, how far out on the rings are you and what to do about it? All right. Now the, the fewer versions increases confidence, but it also, but it also improves fundability. It raises your score, but that's just the latter consequence. It raises your fundability. And this is why we, it, why we have to deal with this so early on in our fundability activities, right? So let's take a look at how did, how on earth did you get to have such a messy credit identity, right? And we'll be talking about, once we learn all of this, guys, in a moment, we're going to be talking about exactly how your identity leads to identity fraud and identity theft, right? We can stop the vast majority, if not all of those problems by creating this PCID. So how to become such a mess? Well, first of all, let's use my example. Okay. My example is before I knew what I was doing, I applied under Merrill Ray Chandler. I applied under Merrill R. Chandler and I played, uh, 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 applied under Merrill Chandler, right? Now, if someone looks at my face on a driver's license and at my address information, they're going to see that all of those are Merrill Chandler, but an algorithm does not do that. Algorithms are designed, the FICO and the lender software algorithms are designed to look for perfect matches, perfect match. Yes. Or perfect match. No. So look at the, look at the, what happened when I was doing all of my work on the, uh, on this process, right? There were a total of eight name variations on my credit report, all of them with different codes that, and those codes are related to different accounts. So they can outline which accounts used, which of uh, which of my identities. No bueno guys, no bueno. In fact, it got so bad that before I, before I handled it, before I cleaned it up, I had 29, there, there are 29 Merrill Chandlers in the credit bureau databases and 13 Chandler Merrill's. So my three Merrill R, Merrill and Merrill Ray, all three of those are combined as part of 29 other ones. So the lenders do not know from the algorithm they do not know how to parse out all of this data to create a perfect match. So we have made it hard for them to approve us. Are you getting this? When we say fundability, we contribute many times and sometimes most of the time, every one of the, the, the borrower behaviors we have done are what's precluding us from getting approved you, that your behaviors because of our lack of ignorance before I knew what I was doing, I was, I was a dumbass when it came to credit. But over the last 25 years, I've dedicated my life to find out what it is that these, that the, the lenders are using and how to score both in personal and business approvals, right? Funding approvals. So the goals of a good credit identity are to have a, 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 a single name, address, phone number, etc. a single version of your identity that is used by open and positive accounts. And then we want to separate it. If you have bad credit, if you've, if you've had bad credit in the past or anything is still reporting on your credit report, if you have derogatory items, 
We don't want this good credit identity, the version of your name, the address, et cetera. We want to separate those two, right? Now, notice we're not talking about creating a new uh, 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 credit uh, using a using a a CPN or or a a, a, a a, a ITN, which is the, the uh, a new social security number. We're not talking about changing anything. We're top. We're talking about adopting a single version of your identity, whichever one you pick, and then we're we're going to promulgate it out into all of the lenders. So whatever version of the name you use. Every lender has that name. If you're, uh, if you are going to use a uh, uh, an address, every lender has that one address, and it, it takes some work. It takes time. It takes energy. But the thing is, is that it is so worth it. It took me a, a, a while, but I created one online uh, identity, Merrill R. Chandler, that was at my address, and and one social security number and one date of birth. So many, so many uh, students come to me when they pull a credit report, they're going to a boot camp, and they, they're literally like, why do I have two, uh, uh, why do I have two dates of birth, right? Why do I have two social security numbers? There's uh, so many reasons. There can be file merges. There could be um, uh, m something transcribed wrong when it's sent out for data entry. There are so many ways that you can end up with with um, mixed data points. But the bottom line for us guys is that we have to establish this. And we're, we're, we're doing this early on in all of the podcast episodes because your identity, you got to start working on it now. You got to get this done now because if they're not going to lend to you, if they don't know exactly the person they're lending to, right? So how do you establish this personal credit identity? I'm going to, let's go through the steps. I'm going to tell you right now. All right. And if you're, if you're listening to this podcast, you might may want to go home and uh, pull this up and watch the video version because I'm giving you actual graphics so that you can see how every one of these steps is so important to, to do. Number one, First of all, you got to choose the version of your name. Now, 60% of, 60 of all uh, credit apps, whether it's personal credit or business credit, ask for a middle initial. Some still say a uh, middle name, like uh, smaller banks, uh, community banks, uh, some even credit unions ask for a, a middle name. Well, you don't, I, I got to tell you, we had one story, uh, 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 one of our team members, one of our team members didn't have a middle name, but she was asked for a middle name on a credit application. So she made one up. And when she, when she was going through her training as a, a credit advisor, she had, she had to actually battle the bureaus because it's not on her birth certificate. It's not on, uh, it's not on her social security card, but it was on a, a couple of applications. And therefore the credit bureau started reporting it. Funniest thing that we had to, with, that we ran into, but as an advisor, she has her own personal experience of how what it takes to to uh, go to, go to battle if that's what it takes to get your identity straightened out. It is the single most fundable part of your uh, profile, guys. Your identity, no freaking joke. So the next thing that uh, the, the next thing that came up is that um, after so you got to choose one. Uh, you got to choose the name version of your name and many times I, I can't answer all the questions but many times I recommend a middle initial if you have a middle name a middle initial so that uh, you can fill it out if they ask for a middle name you still just put a middle initial but whatever you choose is got to be the same damn thing every single time otherwise you're going to propagate more and more uh, um, fuzzy information and algorithms do not like fuzzy information. They want specifics. They want, I, I, they want identical, right? They want identical. Now the next step then is to choose an address version. You got to choose a version of your address that is going to be your, your part of your PCID, your personal credit identity, your fundability address, right? Where can they get a hold of you? And 
uh, there are a number of strategies to do this, but I'm, I'm hitting the most that I can for, uh, for this podcast. Now, what are the best identity addresses? I'm going to tell you straight up the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. First of all, the good is a residence, a residence, what uh, it, apartment, home, mobile home, it does not matter, but is it has to be a residence. The, what, the two unfundables are a post office box and a private mailbox or a, a UPS store, mailbox, et cetera, FedEx stores, what I call commercial mailbox facilities, right? Or it, PMB stands for personal mailbox. Now, the reason why these are, uh, the, the last two are, are negative, why P, uh, the USPS, uh, post office box and the commercial mailbox of the UPS stores is because those are the types of mailboxes uh, that are used by identity thieves to usurp, to file an application and collect the information so, so they can get the credit card, authorize it and use it in your name and ruin your, uh, ruin your profile and fundability and make off with bank money. So the, so they have, uh, this, and this has just happened over the last couple of years. So stay tuned. Every, every episode that we do is going to have new Intel guys, actionable Intel that you can use in, in your fundability, the steps towards creating your uh, long-term fundability. So again, to repeat your, a residence, a residence is a fundable, uh, 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 uh location, a fundable, um, address, a post office box or a mail a commercial mailbox is not fundable unless unless you live in a in a a part of the world where everybody comes to a central post office box or ma commercial mailboxes um, and we have clients in Alaska. We have students all over the country. Um, and uh, we have some in the um, American, uh, the, uh, the Pacific Islands um, that are uh, Guam, et cetera, that are American territories. And they use post office boxes. So, but FICO, underwriting systems, all recognize those zip codes as legitimate places to, uh, to, uh, use a post office box because residences are not there. But if you live in, if you live in a it, it, a, a small town to a large city, they're going to have you identified at, and I'll show you how they're going to have you identified and, and wanting you to be in a residence to be funneled. This is to to get uh, unsecured credit, especially if you're working on the business side, unsecured business lines of credit. It is vital that you have these. All right, so uh, let's take a look at step three. Then what you have to do is once you've picked your address, you have, to, you have to determine what I call the standard format. Actually, I don't even call it the standard format. I'm quoting from the um, U.S. Postal Service. So if you go to the USPS.com, that's the Postal Service website. If you go to USPS.com and um, find on that uh, website, look up a zip code. When you look up the zip code, you, what it gives you a chance to enter in your information. So try, try spelling out streets, try spelling out, um, Avenue, try, uh, in my case, I wrote down one zero two nine one South and spelled out South 1300 East spelled out East number one ten in Sandy, Utah. All right. So that's, so that's my PCID address, but I, to show you, I put it in here and then notice what came, uh, notice what comes out. It comes out as 10291 S 1300 E number 110 Sandy, Utah. Those that, so instead of saying South like and Avenue and drive, it may truncate it, but you need to know what the standard format is because every address in the United States is recorded uh, uh, is a function of this uh, United States Postal Service uh, geographical regions, okay? And all the databases, FICO, um, Falcon, which we'll talk about later, um, uh, uh, um, the lender underwriting software, all use this as a lookup table to define your address. If you have addresses that where you're spelling out drive and parkway and all that stuff, 
you're not you're you need to find the address to use so that you can use um, uh, uh, the standard format. Now, notice also when you look up that website, you'll also see where it says show mailing industry details. And and what you find is that it may say a commercial mail receiving agency with a with a Y that says yes, right? So what you're actually telling is, guess what? I uh, if you're using this mailbox or you're using the post office box, they're going to deny you because they're using this data to make sure that they can find you. They don't want fraud. They, uh, they want to prevent fraud and they want to be able to know that they can actually send you something that you will receive, right? Remember those three criteria. Who am I lending to? Where can I find them? And what exactly, how, am I, I, how exactly am I going to get my money back? So you'll find all of that at the U, USPS.com uh, website. And it's fascinating when you start looking up what your address is in the standard format. But we're going to need that standard format for step four, right? So step four is actually updating your positive credit accounts, updating your positive credit accounts. And, th and the reason is, is that when you update your creditors, right, those lenders are then going... Th uh, those lenders are then going to report that new uh, personal credit identity to the credit bureaus. And then they're going to, then the bureaus, whenever uh, an inquiry is done, when you fill out an application, which we're going to talk about in just a second, when you fill out an application correctly, you're going to be using the exact identity, exact identity that the credit uh, bureaus are, re are, are reporting and that the lenders are reporting to the bureaus. Your application data will match bureau data perfectly. Are you seeing? Remember, we talked about data points and, and, and staying in automatic underwriting. But there are, so, so all future credit reports will be clean of the old reported data. And that's when you dispute the old data is after you have updated the credit reporting system, after you have updated it, right? So let's talk about how to actually do that. And, and guys, there's some great things. If you can get home and watch this episode on, on the video version instead of the audio, I'm telling you, you home run. Because the way you update, the way you update, um, you want to update open and positive accounts reporting on your profile. Nothing else. Nothing else. N we'll talk about it in a second. Who you don't report, uh, you don't update are any negative accounts that have a late pay on it or a collection or, uh, or anything that's reporting negative. Do not, uh, do not do that right? There, there are some amazing things that you can do, uh, in your, in your dispute strategies. The, 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 Boot camp has some wonderful exercises on how to uh, on how to do all this, but I'm telling you, for what we can do in a podcast environment, I'm telling you, do not update any negative accounts. Then you also don't want to update service providers like cell phones, utilities, uh, any of those types of things. You don't want to update um, service providers and d don't update the federal and state governments, uh, your taxes, or any of those things. You can you can keep it. I I could be Merrill Ray Chandler here because that's my birth name. But my creditors don't need a birth name; they just need a consistent name. So I use Merrill R Chandler here and Merrill Ray over here. All right. So just you don't have to update it. if it says Merrill R here for you. Your version of that name. Um, if for federal and state governments and for service providers, you don't have to change it. Don't you? You don't change it. I'm saying you just don't update the only ones you date with with the new version of your name the the chosen version of your name the chosen version of the standard format of your address those are what you update and only to positive creditors so i'm going to give you a couple of uh, uh let me tell you how to now go through the update process right this is uh still step number four so you're going to go online. If you, if you have an online account, we'll talk about uh, telephones in a second, uh, 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 making a phone call. But if you're going online, you log into your account 
change your name and address to reflect your chosen PCID, that personal credit identity that you have chosen, right? Sometimes they let you change one or both. If they don't, then they, th you may have to call in and they may ask for your identity, right? Well, my identity, if my identity says Merrill Ray Chandler and I want it to be Merrill R, then you just go ahead and tell them, um, hey, my, my for 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 to protect my identity from identity theft and fraud, I have chosen Merrill R. Chandler as my online uh, financial name, right? My PCID. Now, of course, creditors aren't going to know what PCID means, but you just say as my personal credit identity, I want it to be Merrill R. Chandler. Okay. Now you you can use use only the standard format of the address and you verify it three times. What I mean by verify is what you're going to do is you are going to call. Now we go, let's go into the call um, category. You're going to call your, your creditor and tell the representative you want to update your name, address, and phone number. Ask the representative to tell you all the versions of your name that are on file and all your addresses. Then you're going to ask for all the phone numbers and you're going to ask for all the names you have on file. All right. Ask for all of them and then tell them, please delete everything except for Merrill R. Chandler. Yes, I'm telling you, yes, I want to be on your credit account. No, just kidding. Use the version of the name that you've chosen. In my case, Merrill R. Chandler. And then I'm asking them to delete all the other versions because they are not relevant. I don't live at that address. I am not part of that. And sometimes they may read a number and you're like, that's my ex-mother-in-laws from 20 years ago. Please delete it, right? Get rid of everything that you can and then tell the representative your PCID name, address, uh, all your data and have them spell it back to you. I spell my name out and they spell it back just to make sure that it's crystal clear. Then ask the rep to delete the other versions and then call the creditor again. You're gonna hang up on that phone call. You're gonna call the same number on the back of your credit card and you're gonna ask again and until they have deleted all the other ones and they have updated your file with just your PCID. Here's, here is why it's so important. And you're going to hear me say this in podcast after podcast after podcast. You have to verify until you get the same answer three times. We just did a, we just did a, um, we vetting some uh, business credit cards. We asked Chase three times what their credit reporting is for a couple of their, of, of their business cards. And we got three different answers. You call until you get the same answer three times and most likely that's the accurate answer. So you're gonna keep calling your um, creditor and until that PCID, that personal credit identity is flawless and it's the only one on their records. Because then guys, it's the only one that they will report to uh, 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 to future lenders and it's the only one you will put on your application. And so now you have perfect data sync, uh, sync up between what your application says and what's on the credit bureau database. Are you following me here? This is how we hack your personal identity. You have total control over this, but you got to do the work to make it happen. Right? So awesome. Awesome. Let's go to the next thing. Now, sometimes they're going to ask you to do, <laughs> and I love this. I just had to put it in here. Sometimes they're going to ask you security questions when you're ordering the credit report or you're talking to the creditor, right? Well, notice that here's all these things. Hey, where uh, uh, a previous employer, right? Here's credit sense. Um, and d do you have one of these auto loans? Yeah. Pick the auto loan. Now notice this one they, they may actually guys, they may actually ask you using your date of birth, please select your astrological sun sign of the Zodiac from the following choices. Are you kidding me? They may actually ask you how, what, what, so just be patient be patient, be patient because they're trying, these are their ways of verifying who you are and you have to prove who you are. And as I've said in other, in other episodes, 
guys, w- the magic turns in our favor when we stop proving w- up what we put on our credit profile and we start get staying in automatic underwriting because all the data points match. They would not ask this. They do not I- ask for identification if they know it is you, period. They do not ask if they know it's you. Who's responsible for them knowing that it's you that's asking for a credit report or applying for credit? You are. Nobody else. Get this straight through your head. Nobody is responsible except for you. And you've been giving them mixed signals, mixed data for your entire life, most of you. This is how we fix it. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at step five, and this is the most important part. You got to clean up all the data, clean up all the data. I have I have entire presentations, guys, that I do where I say, "Hey, did you know that you are literally telling a lender not to approve you by what you put on your application?" Well, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what that means. When you step five is you have to apply using your PCID perfectly. So if you've chosen, in my case, if I chose Merrill R. Chandler, then whether it says middle initial or middle name, I put in Merrill R. Chandler because that's what's on my credit bureau records. And when I fill out an application, always use all capitals, all capitals. I don't, Act like you're in, remember back in when we were in, in first and second and third grade and we're, we're using the little uh, dotted lines between the two broad lines and we're making our A's and our B's and our C's. We get so sloppy in our, in our, um, in our, our writing. Use block letters, all capital, because that's what they record. All capitals, block letters. So, in this case, you're, I'm going to use Merrill R. Chandler, and then I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use exactly my PCID address. I'm going to put in one zero two nine one S thirteen hundred E number one ten, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, the zip plus four doesn't matter. We have not found any material differences between zip code and zip plus four. So you don't you put it in, don't put it in. It doesn't matter. I, I, I never use uh, zip plus four because sometimes the lender software, the FICO software adds zip plus four for you. So I don't put it in. All right. But your most important activity, guys, I cannot emphasize this enough. Your most important activity is making sure that you apply using your perfect singular personal credit identity, your PCID. Because if I put Ray in here, or if I if it's not clear and they only put an R in there instead of a, two R's for my name, then I'm going to end up with another one being reported on my bureaus. And then I'm not on the bullseye, the funding bullseye. I'm in the outer rings. And those outer rings is where I get lower approvals or denials because they don't know who, the, when I say they, the underwriting software does not know who it's lending to because as, as we've covered uh, a little bit before and as we're going to deep dive in a, 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 a very, uh, an episode that's occurring very soon, when the, the, the software is only looking for perfect matches and the lenders have empowered the software with 100% of approval authority if it matches perfectly. So now we no longer have to prove what's on our application. Our borrower behavior they're measuring, our application information matches the online databases that they check and your approvals are a, it, are simple, elegant, and effortless with higher limits. If I blow it here on my application, I'm going to, I'm just gonna confuse the software more and I'm out of the game, all right? Now, why is all of this important? Why is all of this important? Well, it's it's actually very simple. Once in the credit reporting, in the, in the funding game, the credit reporting game, when I apply using my personal credit identity, then the lenders submit to the bureaus the personal credit identity, perfectly executed. And then 
that's when I the I have a perfect match between my credit application and the bureau data. Perfect match means now they get to start considering the other information on my application, right? If I'm going for business, I'm going for personal, the only then, only then will they consider me for a loan. If they don't know who they're lending to, if the, if the software does not know who it's going to approve, it's not going to approve you or your limits are going to be drastically cut. So that is our, that's our episode for today. The value and importance of your personal credit identity and you have to you have to have this identity in play before anything is meaningful for any of the podcast now you of course listen to the podcast listen to everything before you do a thing if you want but i'm telling you your identity is the first uh, piece of the fundability puzzle that's going to make all the difference in the world so that every activity that you do in any other podcast in the universe you're going to know you're going to you're at least the software will know who it's lending the money to. So, guys, for, to to get a to to get a written view, a uh, 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 a written version of this podcast, go to fundinghackers.com. Follow the blog. Um, you guys are going to be able to literally see all of this information in the uh, in that a uh, blog. You can also watch the video version of this. Do not hesitate to watch it, listen to it three or four times. There's, I know I'm a fire hose. I know, and I'm proud of it because I can give you so much information in so little time. You guys have a, an amazing morning, evening, or night, um, and Godspeed and God bless towards your fundability. Hey guys, thank you for listening to Are You Effable? Please leave comments because I would love to read about your aha moments from this episode. And be sure to visit FundingHackers.com to view the blog post, get important links, join our community, and much, much more. And you gotta tell your friends about this podcast. We want them to become effable too.